Welcome back to another episode of Space This Week. Things are heating up at Starbase as SpaceX continue catch testing ahead of Starship's historic fifth flight, and they moved the Flight 6 Starship to the Massey's test site. China's mysterious space plane returns to Earth after 267 days in orbit, Blue Origin draws closer to its maiden flight of New Glenn as its landing barge is spotted at Port Canaveral, NASA is shipping three components of three different SLS rockets to Kennedy, Vega made its final flight, China conducted two orbital launches, as did SpaceX who launched both the Starlink and the Star Shield mission, the troubled Boeing Starliner returned to Earth uncrewed, Bepi Colombo made its closest ever flyby of Mercury, Artemis 3's ESM module arrived at Kennedy and much, much more. This is seriously one of my biggest episodes ever, I think. So sit back and enjoy. SpaceX are continuing with tests of Starship's giant robot arms, or Mechazilla, as they prepare for Flight 5, which will see the arms attempt to catch Super Heavy from the air. This shot from Lab Padre really highlights just how massive these things really are, while workers tested the ship lifting pins. We also saw SpaceX conduct a full launch to catch test, which started with the arms open and ship QD in the same spot it would be when attached to the vehicle. This then swung out and shortly afterward, we saw the arms close at high speed, simulating a catch procedure. We saw several tests of the chopsticks closing at the fastest speeds we've ever seen, with the close point center in a slightly different spot each time, presumably to test catching the booster in slightly different positions or testing the ability for the arms to adjust their position to account for deviances in Super Heavy's trajectory. NASA Spaceflight highlighted how much momentum is in the chopsticks by providing this shot of a catch test, and look how much wobble is sent through the tower. This other shot from NASA Spaceflight shows all the reinforcements that have been added to the vertical support of the chopsticks. Those rust-coloured unpainted rings are doubler plates that have been installed to reinforce the joints between the individual metal beams, to strengthen the system to take the force of a landing booster. Flight 5 Starship, Ship 30, awaits its flight in the Rocket Garden, complete with its S-30 and Mechazilla decals, but overall, not a lot of updates with this vehicle. Flight 6's Starship, however, is a different story. Over at the production site, we saw crews unloading some counterweights from a self-propelled modular transporter in preparation to transport Ship 31 to the Massey site for testing. It recently had its new heat shield almost completed, and over the cover of night it was moved from the high bay to mega bay 2, whereupon it was hooked up to the bridge crane's two-point lifter and lowered onto the mobile static fire stand. It was then rolled out of the build site and down the road to the Massey's test facility for further tests, where it currently awaits. So much activity at Starbase. It's crazy that in 2019, which still feels like yesterday, the site was little more than a tent and Starhopper. Ever since it completed its flight tests, Hoppy has been a permanent resident of the launch site area. However, it has finally been moved once again, but don't worry, not to the scrap heap hopefully, it was instead moved just across the street, away from the immediate vicinity of the launch pad. I like to think that SpaceX simply doesn't want to risk losing Hoppy in the event of a failed catch attempt of Super Heavy. Whether its current location is a temporary home or a permanent new location remains to be seen. To run through the launches we saw last week, SpaceX conducted two Falcon 9 launches on Thursday and Friday. Thursday's launch took off from Cape Canaveral Pad 40, carrying 21 Starlink satellites to Shell 8 in low Earth orbit. Friday's was the Enrol 113 Star Shield launch from Vandenberg, the third of six dedicated launches of Star Shield, which are military variants of Starlink built by SpaceX and Northrop Grumman. Not a lot is really known about how these differ from regular Starlinks, for obvious reasons, but what we do know is both Falcon 9 missions were successful. Thursday's Falcon 9 made a successful 15th landing on Just Read the Instructions, and Friday's made its 20th on Of Course I Still Love You. SpaceX weren't the only ones launching stuff last week. China launched a Long March 4B on the 3rd of September from the Zichang launch site, carrying three Yaogun 43 reconnaissance satellites to orbit. They also launched a Long March 6 Y11 on Thursday, which carried 10 GSAT Group 3 satellites from the Taiwan Launch Center. These are the latest group to be added to the Geely satellite constellation, which official sources have stated now consists of 30 satellites distributed across three orbital planes to enable 24-hour coverage of 90% of the globe, officially launching satellite communication services for global users. 
We had a historic launch from Ariane Space last Thursday. The final ever flight of Vega lifted off from the French Guiana spaceport, carrying the Sentinel-2C satellite to low Earth orbit. The satellite is an Earth observation spacecraft capable of capturing high-resolution images, ranging from 10 to 60 meters over land and coastal areas. Its applications include supporting services like agricultural monitoring, emergency management, land cover classification, and water quality assessment. Developed and operated by the European Space Agency, the Sentinel-2 series of satellites were manufactured by a conglomerate headed by Airbus Defence and Space. Vega will fly again, but as the upgraded Vega C rocket. This is actually already flown, delivering seven satellites to orbit in 2022. However, its second flight experienced a failure of the second stage, causing loss of payload and leading to long-term grounding while its rocket motor nozzle was redesigned. Vega C's return to flight is so far expected no earlier than the 15th of November 2024. Last Friday, Boeing's Starliner spacecraft finally departed from the International Space Station. Following a troubled spaceflight that saw it suffer helium leaks and outage of five of its eight aft-facing RCS thrusters en route to the station, which NASA and Boeing were ultimately unable to determine the cause of, leading to NASA to deem the spacecraft too dangerous to return to Earth with crew, and as such, it departed uncrewed, though Boeing remained confident that crewed re-entry was a safe option. The journey back to Earth was largely uneventful, but it wasn't completely without issue. There was a brief glitch in the spacecraft's navigation systems, and one of its 12 thrusters to reorient it for re-entry failed to ignite. Despite this, the spacecraft conducted a successful deorbit, and following this, it had good parachute deploy and landed at the White Sand Space Harbor in New Mexico. The Starliner crew, Butch Wilmore and Sonny Williams, will now return to Earth aboard Crew 9 SpaceX Crew Dragon capsule in February 2025, along with NASA astronaut Nick Haig and Roscosmos cosmonaut Alexander Gorbanov, Butch and Sonny now forming the other two members of NASA's Crew 9 mission. So how does this look for Boeing? Well, NASA Administrator Bill Nelson has confirmed that Boeing are still committed to continuing the Starliner program, but in an interesting turn of events, Boeing officials were supposed to attend the post-landing news conference, but cancelled at last minute without providing a reason. Furthermore, following NASA's announcement that the spacecraft would not return to Earth with crew, the company has been very reluctant to answer questions from journalists, only releasing brief statements, Ars Technica being among the publications unable to obtain any clear answers to everyone's most burning questions for Boeing. Now three flights in and still unable to have crew certification, this is an especially embarrassing time for Boeing, especially considering they now need rescuing from the underdog SpaceX, a company Boeing recommended NASA to not even receive a contract for commercial crew, a company that received half the funding that Boeing received, and one that has now flown 12 crewed space flights in total, nine of which were successful crew flights to the International Space Station and they're expected to perform another crewed flight tomorrow. This is the launch of Polaris Dawn, which has been a little delayed due to unfavorable weather conditions and some issues with ground support equipment at the launch pad. Things are looking good for tomorrow though. Polaris Dawn is a bold mission that will become the first ever crewed mission to conduct a spacewalk from Dragon and will fly humans higher in Earth's orbit than anyone since Apollo, with Dragon being sent into a highly elliptical orbit with an apogee of 1,400 kilometers or 870 miles from Earth, passing through parts of the Van Allen radiation belt to provide insight on human health during long-duration spaceflight and space radiation. The mission will also test laser-based Starlink communications and will be the first crew mission from Pad 40 at Cape Canaveral, now that SpaceX have equipped it with a crew access tower. So far, things are looking good for launch, but this is more complex than usual. Because the capsule won't be docking to the ISS, it's crucial that splashdown occurs on time, as it'll only be able to carry limited life support consumables, so favorable weather conditions have to exist both for launch and splashdown. Hopefully tomorrow will go as planned. Tune in next Monday, where I'll be able to cover the launch properly. Hit subscribe and ring the bell so you get notified of that video. Falcon 9 is the only orbital class rocket that recovers and reuses its first stage, but that space is soon to be shared with Blue Origin hopefully. They already have the pedigree with New Shepard, and the enormous New Glenn is rapidly approaching its maiden launch. The date for this though has been pushed back to sometime in November, and it won't be carrying NASA's escapade mission on this, instead carrying a prototype Blue Ring satellite servicing platform, the first national security space launch certification flight for Blue Origin. Escapade is a 
Mars mission, consisting of two satellites that'll study Mars's magnetosphere and how solar wind contributed to the planet losing most of its atmosphere. It was first scheduled to launch on New Glenn in October, but it's now being postponed to spring 2025 due to delays with New Glenn's completion. The time-sensitive nature of Mars missions mean that further delays aren't really an option, as the Earth to Mars transfer window is only open for a limited time. Blue Origin are pushing ahead though. The second stage of the rocket is at the launch pad, preparing to fire up its two BE-3U engines in the coming days. Like Falcon 9, New Glenn's first stage will land on a floating ocean platform, and this was spotted at Port Canaveral last week. Landing platform Vessel 1 is nicknamed Jacqueline, after the now scrapped landing ship that Blue Origin were originally going to use, which is also the name of Jeff Bezos' mother. Ah, It's very exciting that they seem to be planning for a barge landing on the very first flight. No test landing in the water first. If they pull it off before SpaceX catch Super Heavy, then New Glenn will be the biggest booster to land after launching. While a similar profile to Falcon 9, New Glenn is much bigger, with a much greater payload capacity as well. In fact, it'll be the third most powerful rocket in operation if it succeeds. Due to regulations, the landing barge for New Glenn is about the same width as SpaceX's. Both vessels were built by the same company, actually. But New Glenn's is longer, with large buildings at either end, which will presumably house crew on the way to and from the landing zone. I'm guessing they'll evacuate to another ship once the vessel is in position. SpaceX used to have crew board the Falcon 9 drone ships after landing to secure the booster to the deck, so I guess Blue Origin is likely to do the same. Now, there is every chance that one of the buildings contains a secure bunker that will allow crew to remain on board during a landing, but I personally think that is an incredibly unlikely scenario. NASA's Pegasus barge has resumed its long journey from Alabama to Florida. It initially set off from the Marshall Space Center in Huntsville, Alabama on the 21st of August, carrying the cone-shaped vehicle stage adapter for the Artemis II SLS rocket. It's since then stopped off at NASA's Michoud Assembly Facility in New Orleans to pick up more hardware components for both Artemis III and Artemis IV. These components are the boat tail that serves as the fairing around the engine section for Artemis III's SLS and the engine section for Artemis IV. The barge is now ready to continue its journey to Kennedy, carrying three parts of three different SLS rockets. Once in Florida, the stage adapter will be prepared for stacking operations, while the Artemis III and four components will be transferred to the Space Station Processing Facility for outfitting. More hardware arrived at Kennedy last Tuesday. NASA received the European Service Module 3, built by Airbus under contract with the European Space Agency, which will play a crucial role in supporting the four Artemis III astronauts during their three-week trip to the moon aboard the Orion spacecraft, marking the first human return to the lunar surface since Apollo 17 in 1972. Now that it's arrived at Kennedy, it'll be assembled and tested with the crew module. Europe's first spacecraft to Mercury, Bepi Colombo, has successfully completed its fourth gravity assist flyby of Mercury, as it gradually lowers its relative velocity to enter Mercury orbit in November 2026. During this latest flyby, it captured some incredible photos of Mercury's impact craters with its MCAM-2. This image here shows a large peak ring basin within a large crater that's 210 kilometers wide and named after the Italian composer Antonio Vivaldi. There's a gap in the basin's peak ring, which is believed to have been caused by recent lava flows that entered and flooded the crater. This flyby was the spacecraft's closest yet at 165 kilometers from the surface, and it got its first clear view of Mercury's South Pole. The next flyby will take place on the 1st of December, with the one after on the 8th of January next year, before the spacecraft arrives in November 2026, where it will operate until 2029, studying Mercury's magnetosphere and its planetary surface and internal composition. After spending 268 days in space, China's secretive space plane returned to Earth. And when I say it's secretive, I mean it. We don't actually know what the craft even looks like. It theoretically could look like this, as it's extremely likely to be based on the Boeing X-37. So in order to have some B-roll here, I'll just show footage of that. The spacecraft originally launched from the Jiquan Satellite Launch Center atop a Long March 2F in December 2023 on its third mission. We don't know what exactly the space plane was doing up there, much like we don't fully know what the X-37 does on its space flights, Chinese state media has stated that the craft will pave the way for more convenient and affordable round-trip methods for the peaceful use of space in the future. 
One thing of note is that the spacecraft was observed to eject a small object into orbit, as was seen on its previous two flights. The craft was then seen to conduct rendezvous and proximity operations with the object, in that it was likely testing capabilities to get close and potentially simulate a hypothetical docking with the object demonstrating the ability to perform maintenance missions on satellites, or, on the other hand, potentially tamper with adversary satellites during future conflicts. Laon Aerospace was grounded last week. Tried as I might, I unfortunately didn't have time to create a Kerbal Space Program video that I was satisfied with, thanks to some in-real-life delays, so here's some footage of a mission that I ultimately never actually finished, for now at least, due to the Kraken continually destroying the vehicle. I'm confident the flight should return in time for this Saturday though, so hit subscribe so you don't miss that video. But that is the end of today's episode of Space This Week, I do hope you enjoyed today's flight, and of course, big thanks to all the names on the right there. Yeah, I got kind of bored of my old outro screen that I've been using for three years now, so I made this new one. Is it better, do you think? I think it looks nice. So, yeah, that's, uh, that's it. Hmm. Okay, okay, bye then.